Hi Cohort. I made a bunch of versions of this and I'm trying to get it down shorter for you. The first was 17 minutes. I'm going to tell you about the WISC-5, the Weschler Intelligence Scale for Children, since it's our week on intelligence testing, general ability testing. Um, the WISC-5 is the most current version uh, of this test for kids ages 6 to 16 years, 11 months. Uh, it's one of the main tests, main intelligence tests out there. We would not be administering this test because we are not psychologists, but it's really likely, uh, if, we're, if you are working with kids, it's likely that you will uh, work with a kid who takes this test um, as an assessment to help, like if they're struggling in school and everyone's trying to figure out what will help, whether they uh, qualify for services, they might, they might take this test or, as part of a battery of psych and cognitive tests. So in that case, we as counselors, therapists, can have a really important role because this is the kind of test that gives us IQ. And people can tend to really latch on to the number, um, write someone off who has a low IQ in terms of the number, and the thing that I am seeing is one of the most important for us to remember is that the number does not actually mean that much. And so if we can be a confident voice saying to, uh, to parents and to the kid, the number does not actually mean that much, uh, and helping them get more nuanced, helpful information from their results, then that is a really important contribution. A little bit of history. The Weschler scales have been around for a while. Weschler Bellevue Intelligence Scale, 1939. Developed over time, different versions split off into one for kids, one for adults, other versions for other purposes, and now we have the WISC-5 uh, since 2014. Um, it uh, developed in the context of, in like the 20s, schools were getting interested in testing kids for special classes, the army was interested in testing to know who to make officers and assigning people, and Weschler was actually an army examiner, so it developed partly out of that context. Uh, in the current version of the test, there are five domains, five indexes, uh, verbal comprehension, visual spatial, fluid reasoning, working memory, processing speed, and all of those together give you one full-scale IQ. And you can also look at the individual score for each index. And sometimes the individual scores are more meaningful than the full-scale IQ, because like if you have like a couple of 120s and a couple of 80s, it doesn't mean very much to say you're 100. Uh, it's much more useful to say well, you have really high verbal comprehension and processing speed, and then it looks like you're struggling a little bit more with visual spatial tasks and fluid reasoning. Uh, there are, oh, I don't think I said, the full-scale IQ has a mean of 100, standard deviation of 15. There are multiple subtests within each index. The tasks are things like arranging blocks, arithmetic, remembering number sequences, vocabulary, uh, similarities between concepts, and it in each test it gets more difficult as it goes along. Uh, so like similarities progresses from how is a pear and a peach similar to how is reality and a dream similar, how is a shadow and a fingerprint similar. Uh, and the psychologist is tracking answers, stopping after a certain threshold of incorrect answers. Uh, you don't necessarily take every single subtest. There are certain ones you need to come out with the full-scale IQ. Um, and the procedure is really standardized, strict protocol. It does call for establishing rapport with the child, even within the protocol. Um, and there's some discretion in things like standard is to do it at a table, but if the child will focus better on the floor, you could choose to do it on the floor. Um, 
from a psychologist who's recording the answers, how long things take, and also a bunch of more subjective observations about focus, attention, anxiety, anything about how the kid is taking the test. Uh, and those go into the final write-up too, which is ironic considering that the reason we have these tests is because we want objective data, objective data, but then even the protocols acknowledge that the objective data alone would not would not be useful enough in itself. Um, and I talked with some Antioch PsyDs uh, who administer tests, this test and others like it, and they are taught not to overemphasize the number and to uh, never just give the score in isolation, but be looking at the whole battery of tests and what themes are in common across the tests and drawing out what seems like the meaningful story. Uh, so, what are the strengths or usefulnesses of this test? It can be useful if what your client needs is to qualify for services that are going to help them have a better school experience. Um, that's the way they would get that, typically, in the current system. It can also give you clarifying information about what is going on for a kid, um, like if they score really high on some domains and low on others, that can help you narrow your sense of where their struggle is. It's been really carefully uh, developed and revised over the years. They've made efforts to address cultural bias, um, and it is one of the most highly regarded intelligence tests that's out there. At the same time, there are issues about intelligence testing in general. No one knows exactly what intelligence is. We are approximating in trying to test it. Um, and the aspects of, yeah, it's a construct. The aspects of intelligence that the test is choosing to measure are culturally defined. So Western culture values a kind of intelligence that shows up in being able to reproduce patterns with blocks. Some cultures might not care at all about that. And so people from that context might not have that skill developed, but would have others that are not within what this test is looking at at all. Like I'm thinking of the carrying things on your head kind of intelligence. Um, there are links to class and educational privilege. Uh, tasks are similar to what a child might do in school. So are we measuring education and quality of education rather than innate ability? And as I mentioned before, sometimes the full-scale IQ is not even meaningful if there's a large spread between the domain scores. And on top of that, even sometimes the domain scores are not valid if there's a large spread between the subtest scores within a domain. So sometimes you have results that are not even interpretable. Uh, and your results could vary a lot from one time taking the test to another, but we tend to read a lot into small fluctuations because we really want to say something based on data, and this is the data that we have. And I think the fact that parents can and people can put so much stock in the number is a, a potential weakness, uh, a way that the test has the potential to do harm. So that brings me back to what we as therapists and counselors can do uh, in interacting with kids getting testing and their families, that we can help clients and families not uh, be so overawed by the number, um, but to question the importance of the number and look for what information can be actually helpful from the results, because chances are the number does not actually mean that much. Therapeutic assessment is this whole approach to assessment that tries to use the whole process, whole assessment process, as an intervention, as part of the therapy. Uh, and its goal is to provide an experience that shifts the story parents hold about their child toward one that is more coherent, accurate, compassionate, and useful. So those seem like good words to hold on to in uh, thinking about interacting with families and kids around assessment. So let's
let's finish thinking about an imaginary child named Valerie. Let's imagine that she's a real child. And uh, let's say she's eight years old, having trouble in school. Uh, and the teacher says she seems smart and quick one-on-one, -on -one, but she is not finishing her work or doing it correctly. So the school wants testing to find out what can be done. And the WISC scores show quick uh, processing time and high verbal comprehension, but then lower um, visual, spatial, and fluid reasoning. And let's say her scores in working memory domain are not valid because she did really well on some of the subtests and not well on other subtests. So, uh, and the psychologist observed that her distractibility seemed to vary and that that had to do with how she did. Um, so her full-scale IQ overall is below average, but it's not meaningful because she was above average on some of the subtests and then uh, didn't do as well on other, sorry, some of the indexes, not subtests. So then, choose your own adventure from here. You could say version A is her parents' take on the explanation that her IQ is below average. They figure, okay, she's not very smart, and they get this identity in their heads that she's not their academic daughter, she's not so good in school. And so she takes on that role and goes through school in that way. Uh, version B could be that Valerie's counselor or therapist helps the family set aside the number that is not meaningful and look for the useful information about Valerie's particular strengths and challenges academically. Um, they can collaborate with her teachers uh, to tailor the support to her particular challenges, to give her validation and encouragement for her strengths, and, uh, and then that affects her whole journey through school. So let's be therapists and counselors who help version B happen when we're working with kids who are being evaluated using the WISC. Thanks guys.